Well, good morning, Bow Valley. My name is Andrew Kobe. I'm the youth and young adults coordinator here at uh, Bow Valley. Thank you, Grayson, uh, for those of you who may not know. And uh, over this, the course of this uh, year, we're in the middle of a year-long series uh, thinking about faith, hope, and love and how uh, that interacts with our lives today. And we're in the middle of, of thinking about the first of these, which is faith. And last week was perhaps the pinnacle of faith in the Christian tradition. It's what we hinge our faith on. It's it, when Jesus died and rose again from the grave, that's what we believe in. And so what I want to talk about just for a little bit today, the week after Easter, is how do we keep that faith? How do we keep that faith in a world that is constantly trying to tell us that it's not worth keeping? How do we keep that faith when we have friends and family members and colleagues who don't believe in the same thing that we do? What do we do with our faith the week after Easter? I think the, the way that we need to approach it this morning is, I think we need to ask two questions. And the, the first of these questions is, uh, what did the disciples do after the first Easter? How did they keep their faith after the first Easter 2,000 years ago? And the second question is, uh, what can we do now? What can we do now in order to keep our faith? And so to do that this morning, uh, I hope to uh, look at, at the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the book that, that details the journey of the early church as they went out from, from what Jesus taught and they formed into what we now call the Christian community. And so we're, we're going to look at the book of Acts, specifically Acts 2, verses 42 to 47. But uh, I'll just give a quick recap of what has happened up until that point. Uh, Jesus, after his uh, resurrection, appeared to many different people. And he, uh, he appeared to his disciples, and he appeared to thousands of other people. And then he ascended and kind of just left the disciples uh, on their own. But he said, just hold on a minute, wait, wait in Jerusalem, and there's going to be a gift coming, and it's going to be the gift from my father. And, and we read on in Acts, and, and we find out that this gift was actually the pouring out of the Holy Spirit over the disciples, and in, in that the, the Holy Spirit of God actually came to dwell inside of the disciples, and, and we call this the, the, the moment or the, the experience of Pentecost. And this, this Holy Spirit then gave, gave, him, uh, gave the disciples the ability to speak in other people's mother tongues. So imagine you're just chilling on the Galilean shore. And these guys come up to you and they start speaking in the language which they didn't know you were from there. But yet they spoke there. And so, rightly so, people were a little like, are we sure about these? Like, I don't know about these guys. These guys are a little weird. Uh, and so then, Peter answers for the group. And I, I like to think myself of, of Peter as a youth pastor. I, think, I, th I like to think Peter's a youth pastor. One, because I think he's a really cool guy, and all youth pastors are cool, right? <laughs> and the second is that, well, he was preaching after Easter, so that must mean that he's a youth pastor as well, right? <laughs> but anyway, Peter gives this, this great sermon, and it's, it's, it's probably better than anything I could do, so maybe you should just go read that one for yourself. But, but then we, we now reach the passage that we are going to attempt to tackle today as we ask these two questions. And why don't we go ahead and, and read this together this morning? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. 
Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So this morning, we're going to ask these two questions, and we're going to start with the first question. What did the disciples do after... uh, after the, the first Easter. But I want to keep, I want us to keep that second question in the back of our mind. That as we think about what the, what the disciples did, how can that translate to us today? Well, I think the disciples, they did three things after they received the Holy Spirit. And, in, and three things that we find in this passage of Acts 2. And I think the first thing that they did was that they grouped. They grouped together in community. I don't know if, if, if you know this, but there's, there's a, a psychological thing where, where we are actually drawn to, to like-minded people. It's like uh, I'm a Golden Knights fan, and so I'm going to be drawn to other fans of Golden Knight, the Golden Knights hockey team as we prepare for this playoff push. Sorry, Flames fans. I know you just missed out on that opportunity, but... But we, we gather together with like-minded people. And so the disciples did the same thing. They gathered with people who all devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to fellowship. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And they, they, they gathered, they grouped together in this, in this like-minded group, and they were all passionate about the same things, and that is sharing the message of the gospel and living out the gospel together. And I think it's interesting to note in this passage, if we look at verse 44, uh, it says that all of the believers were together and that they had everything in common. Now, I, I don't know if, if, if you quite catch the significance of that in this Day and age. But this, this newly gathered group of people were all together. They were all together. In other words, all people, whether male or female, slave, Roman soldier, former Pharisee, whatever, it, whatever they were, they were all together. They were all sitting at the same table. In that culture, in that day, there were different places at the table for different people groups. There was even different times to eat, depending on if you were a slave or a free person. And so to have everyone together, it's, it's special. It's like, a, I don't know what your family did, but my family growing up in, at, at events such as Thanksgiving and Easter, is we, we had the, the kids were all sent off to the kids' table, right? And the, the adults... And the kids were over here, and they were having a good, we were having a good time. We were laughing. We were joking. And the parents, I don't know what they were, they were talking politics or something boring over here. And, and there's, this two different, there's these two different tables. But at, and in, in the same way that once you grow up, you join the adult table, like this group was joined together, and everyone sat at the same table. Everyone that devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer, sat at the same table. It was a great equalizer among the people of that day. I think the second thing that the the early disciples did is that they gave. The early disciples, they were generous with their possessions. In verse uh, 45, we, uh, we can see that they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And I I know what you guys are thinking right now. Listen, I, I don't really want to sell my house. I don't really want to sell my car. I kind of value these things. I, I value these properties. They're worth a lot. Like, I don't think you know how much they're worth. Look at the housing market. Car prices have gone up. Like, I don't want to sell these. And I, I think that maybe we need to get a better understanding of what this passage is actually talking about. 
I like the NRSV translation here. And the NRSV translation reads, they would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. As any had need. In other words, the the early church was in the business of need meeting. When they saw a need, they would meet it. That when, when they saw a need, they wouldn't necessarily sell their... Oh, thank you, G-Day. <laughs> when they saw a need, they wouldn't necessarily just, just meet it, but they, that they would actually go to great lengths to meet it. They would even go so far as selling their possessions in order to meet this need. And so I think that it is important that we recognize this. And it's important to recognize that it wasn't just financial needs. Some people uh, like to refer to three different ways that people can give. It's time, talents, and treasures. You, you give your time for something. You give talent that you may have received from God in order to serve, and you give your possessions or your money or your financial uh, wealth in order to serve. And the, the early church did all three. They gave time, they gave talents, and they gave treasures. If they saw a need that required tedious work, they would work at it. If they saw a family that needed a new table, they'd call up their local carpenter and say, hey, can you get us this table? If they saw a family that was struggling for food, they'd provide the meal. If someone was struggling spiritually, they would do their best to meet the spiritual need of that person. These things happen both inside this group that had formed, inside this Christian group, but they also looked beyond and they served those who were not even a part of their group. They were in the business of meeting people's needs no matter who or no matter when. I think the third thing that they did is that they gathered. In verses 46 and 47 in this passage, it reads that, that they continued to meet every day in the temple. They broke bread in their homes. And I, I want to pause and make just a little bit of a distinguish between, between gathered and grouping. Because I think they're a little bit different. Grouping, we're, we're all in, in one group. We're, we're a group of like-minded individuals, but, but gathering is different. When we gather, we participate in something greater than just sitting there in a group. When we, when we gather, we, we actually participate in God's work in this world. And it, it's interesting that they did this every day. That it was a, it was a daily occurrence that they gathered. And I, I think this is, it's Camp Sunday, and one of the greatest things about camp is that you get to be with believers. You get to be with other people every single day. And that every single day you are, you are within a community. You're with other believers, and you are all focused on God. And I think that's one of the, the many, many great things about camp. Another interesting thing to note in this passage is that they did it in different spaces, that they met in public spaces, but they also met in private spaces. They met in the temple, but they also met in their homes. Now, this meeting in the temple, it's a little bit weird. Now, you may be wondering why, and I'll, I'll tell you, it's, the temple was still a Jewish facility. These Christians were coming into a Jewish facility and they were reading scriptures and they were hanging out and and praising God with the Jews. Some of the Jews were even trying to kill them and yet they still were in the temple every day. Why? Why would the early Christians still go to the temple even though it was was a a part of their past story? Well, I think that they did this because it was ritual. That growing up every day, they went to the temple. Every day they went to the temple to read the scriptures, to experience 
God's love. And I, I think that with their newfound knowledge of Christ's death and resurrection on the cross, with God's plan fully completed, that somehow this, this, this Old Testament became even sweeter, that when the passages were read, they connected with it on an even deeper level because they so firmly believed in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They also met in the homes. Now, the, the home is a little bit of a sacred space now in our day, right? We, whenever we have guests over, it's always, oh, we need to grab the vacuum quickly, pick up all the garbage, clean my home, rush, rush, rush. We need, to, we need to get this in pristine, perfect condition for these guests. We can't let them know that we're actually messy. We need to have it perfectly clean. But why, why is this the case? Why is this such a sacred space now in our day? Well, I think that it's because the home is where we learn about one another. The home is where we get to know the stories of our fellow community members. If you walk into me and Noah's basement suite and you looked and you saw the wreath on the door and the Christmas tree still sitting on the table, you might be wondering, what is up with these, like you'll have some questions, right? I'm sure you guys have questions, right? Or you're thinking I'm ridiculous, either one of those two. But it's actually because we're trying, to, we're trying to grow as friends, and so we're trying to get each other gifts every month. We call it the 12 months of Christmas. And, and, and so by, by entering into our house, by, by entering into our sacred space, that, that you actually begin to figure out a part of our story. And I think this is why that they met in the early their ch- early church in their homes. It's because they were trying to figure out who they were as a collective identity. And the way that they did this was by examining each individual identity in light of Jesus' saving grace on the cross. And so we move to our second question. What can we do now? 2,000 years later, we're far removed from the first Easter, and it's an entirely different culture. In fact, this culture that we live in now, it's, it's trying to tell us what's important. Our culture is, is trying to tell us that there is other things that matter a lot more than this Jesus guy. Our culture is trying to tell us that the image you put out there, that the experiences you have, that the person you will become, that, that your finances, your wealth... Everything is more important than Jesus. And there's so much pressure on the individual. There's so much pressure on each and every one of us as we go into the daily lives to keep our faith, to keep our sights pointed straight, to keep focusing on the cross. There's so much pressure because the world is telling us to not. The world is telling us to to leave the cross and, and go get more money or leave the cross and go and post an amazing picture on social media of the meal you ate last night. But how do we keep our faith in the midst of this in, insane pressure that is on each and every one of us? Well, I'd like to suggest that we follow in the footsteps of the early church, that we group, that we give, and that we gather together as a community. You might say, this is great. How do I do that? How do I, how do we, tell me, give me, give me some five steps programs. And I can't, I can't necessarily do that, but I'll, I'll do my best. First of all, congratulations. If you guys are here watching online this morning or, or here, you're already grouped. You've already joined this community of like-minded individuals, that, that you have stepped into a space where we are a community that is finding and following Jesus daily. So congratulations, you've already, check, step one is completed. Good job. What about giving? Well, the early church was in the business of meeting needs, and so just maybe some questions to ponder. What needs need to be met in your community? What needs need to be met in this community? How can each and every one of us be in the business 
of meeting needs? How can we become need meters in our daily lives? Maybe for you, you, you have a legitimate need, that you're struggling with something, and I would encourage you, if that's the case, reach out. Reach out to this group of like-minded individuals. Give them the opportunity to be need meters in your own life. What about gathering? How do we gather 2,000 years later after the first Easter? Well, the formal gathering, we're in the middle of it. And it, it might seem a little bit silly to talk about this. I mean, it might seem like I'm preaching to the choir because we're, we're all here, we're all attending, right? But I know that there are people here today, both in person and online, there are people here today that are questioning the value of church, that they're not fully set on this whole church thing. They might say, I, I love that Jesus died for me. I love that Jesus uh, saved me on the cross. But how, why church? Why do I have to hang out with these people? I don't even like people that much. Why do I have to hang out with these people? Why am I here today? What is the value of church? How can I trust the church? Isn't it corrupted? These are good questions to be asking. I ask these questions frequently, but I think that we can learn from the disciples and we can learn from the other people in this community. And we can learn that, man, it's worth it. That when you, when you step into the doors on a Sunday morning, Man, you just feel the love. And you feel each and every person in here that, that cares for you. And I encourage you, I can promise you, stick with it. Keep coming. It's worth it. I think we also need to do a better job of meeting in the home. What would it look like for you to invite someone from this community into your home. Now, some of you, some of you right there are like, oh no, that can't be me. Uh, my home is closed. I'll go to someone else's home. They can feed me. But, but what, would, what would it look like for you to invite someone into your home? What would it look like for you to invite them into your story? How would you share that story over a meal? How would our church look if each and every one of us did this? How would we grow as a community if each and every one of us consistently shared our stories with the people in this room and the people online? Now, it might be scary that the early church did this daily, so maybe just try this. Just one day this week, try to have someone in your home one day this week, I know, don't, you don't have to clean it. Everyone's messy, okay? You don't have to clean it. Just have someone in your home. Invite them into your story. I think the, the last verse in this passage, whoa, last verse in this passage speaks to the Lord adding to the disciples' number. It says, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And I just want to say, like, there are so many other people out there that are struggling with the same pressures that we do. There are so many people out there that are, that are feeling the pressures of this individualistic world, that, that you have family members, you have friends, I have family members, I have friends that do not know what this community is all about, that they, that they are longing for this community. I mean... When we, when we look at the anxi anxiety and loneliness and, and the levels of depression that have, that have come post-COVID, people are longing for a community. They're longing for a group that will love and care for them. And, and I think the last thing that I'll say on this is that we need to allow the same Holy Spirit that was poured out into the disciples 2,000 years ago to direct us as we bring out other people into this community that we call church, that, that as, as everyone deals with the pressures that is placed on every single one of us, that, that in some way, the Holy Spirit will guide us to convince people that, that there's more, that there's more, there is a community that is passionate and that will care and that will meet your needs 
and that will gather together and support and love each and every one of us and each and every person in this world.